Well, let's see here. Recently, you appeared on talk radio with LA Police Chief Darrell Gates. What was the inside story, and do you feel you were heard by him? Well, yes, I won't give this too much time. I did appear with Daryl Gates on his radio show. Clearly, they're desperate to raise ratings. They'll do almost anything at this point. And Daryl Gates was uh, a pussycat, very easily intimidated by, I mean, I make no great claims in this area, but intelligence. <laughs> he, he completely folded in the presence of, uh, you know, academic calm, big words, citation, that sort of thing. Um. <laughs>
Uh, you're, you're, you believe in the Darwinian theory of evolution. You say the apes uh, turned into humans after eating uh, an awful lot of mushrooms. Uh, and, I, and I'm just paraphrasing some of this. Uh. No, that's right. You see, one of the great embarrassments to evolutionary theory is that it's very hard to explain how we evolved from some kind of a primate or some kind of monkey. The human brain doubled in size in just under two million years. Well, a lot of people don't, don't believe that, you know. They, they you mean they, they reject evolution? Well, they've got, a different, they've got a different theory than the Darwinian theory. I mean, they, right. they, they read the Bible and they have a, a, you know, a feel for the Bible and believe that... Uh, that, that pretty well explains it. Well, but I'm talking about even among scientists who are gung-ho for evolution, it's a great uh, embarrassment that they're unable to explain the sudden explosive doubling of the human brain size in just under two million years. The best uh, theory that we're getting out of the academics would make the big league baseball pitcher the paradigm of evolution because they're saying... To coordinate throwing a small object at about 120 miles an hour through a three by three foot space, a hundred feet away, you've got to have a lot of brain power to do that. I find that theory, no matter how big a baseball fan you are, a, a little inadequate. I think that uh, what we're going to have to look at here is an environmental factor. Uh, that somehow gave our remote ancestors a leg up in the evolutionary struggle for daily existence. And the interesting thing about psilocybin, which is the chemical that is in many of these psychoactive mushrooms, is that at doses so low that you can't tell you've taken anything, they've done experiments with people and you have an increased ability over your normal ability to detect edge uh, edges moving and motion this would be tremendously important to a hunting animal if there were a plant in the environment that was the equivalent of a pair of chemical binoculars then those animals that use that plant are going to have a better and more dependable food supply than their competitors, and they're going to outbreed them, and they're going to replace them. And I think looking at chemicals like this in the environment for clues to how we changed from some kind of a monkey into a civilization with a worldwide electronic network, vast databases, instruments hurled outside the solar system, I understand why people stick with their Bibles. It's a pretty tall order to coax that kind of a transformation out of a monkey. And yet, if you believe what science is telling us, this in fact happened. And I think the missing link is psychoactive plants in the early human uh, environment. Uh, that's interesting. I, you know, I, I think, uh, <laughs> of course, those and uh, those who believe in the Bible will, will tell you that... Uh, it's all very, very clear there. You simply have to believe, and if you do believe it, and there's a lot of scientists who, uh, who really believe uh, in, not in the evolutionary theory, but uh, they believe that it's, uh, uh, the, the true word comes out of the Bible, and, I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, I, and, and that you're never going to find that, that missing link. So it's interesting that you suddenly have believed, uh, or suddenly uh, have, have come up with this theory. Maybe not suddenly. Maybe you've done this uh, over a long period of it time. It took a while, actually, in my first book, Food of the Gods, uh, I used the Bible as an argument for some of the points I was trying to make, because if you go back and look at the story of Adam and Eve from a little different perspective, I think what we've got here is the story of history's first drug bust. Maybe, maybe it was, a, maybe it was a, a mushroom and not an apple. Well, whatever it was, the landlord broke the lease, the young lady corrupted her roommate, and uh, everybody got kicked out of paradise and had to work for a living. We haven't gotten back there yet, have we? <laughs> That's what I'm here to preach. I think the way back... Uh, has to do with recovering uh, this prehistoric habit of using psychoactive plants essentially to build community. These tribes were almost like a single mind. 
the ego as we know it uh, didn't exist. And uh, these people were just like you and me in terms of their physical appearance, their brain capacity. And perhaps for as long as half a million years, they uh, built no cities, uh, had no armies, had uh, a very, a very uh, respectful relationship to their environment. And I think our social style, which relies on science and urban populations and uh, standing armies and politics prosecuted at the end of the gun, is a maladaptive style that arose when this, uh, you could almost say, mushroom-driven paradise collapsed. And the story of Adam and Eve is uh, the story of this moment of transition when the mushrooms, for reasons that we could talk about, became uh, unwelcome and probably unavailable, and the style of civilization that we're all familiar with began to suppress that. Well, and you, do you consume <laughs> these uh, psychedelic mushrooms? Well, I do when I have the opportunity. I mean, I'm so busy now with all these books that I do it far less often than I think is probably healthy. But in the past, I have certainly done it, and I'm familiar with the effects of most other psychoactive uh, compounds. I think if you're a scientist, you have a responsibility to uh, actually experience what you're studying. Anthropology, from if you're not going to join in the activities of the people you're studying turns into a fairly sterile kind of voyeurism. Well, we're going to get right back to that uh, uh, because it is exceedingly interesting. Uh, I'd like to make a, a little bit of a comparison going back to the uh, Timothy Leary days and mm -hmm. his... Uh, he was saying many of the same things uh, back in the 60s about LSD and some of the other drugs. Uh, and I'm going to get back to that, uh, but uh, we're going to have to go to a guy who I hope has not been munching on mushrooms, but he's got to give us a clear view of what's happening in traffic. Uh, uh, you noticed how great the traffic was for you today, Chief. Hey, you tried to keep it that way. Neat. It was neat. All right, in this report. Hey, now's your chance to talk to the Chief at 1-800-767-4KFI and locally at 520-1KFI. And we're back, and it's also your chance to talk to uh, Michael McKenna, our guest here. Uh, uh, Terrence he's, McKenna. He's Terrence McKenna. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about Michael Clark in the newsroom, and uh, and by God, it's Terrence McKenna. Uh, and uh, he's a guy who's spent some time in the Amazon and has looked at uh, what is taking place there, looking at some of the herbs and plants, and, uh, and particularly mushrooms. They call him the Mushroom Man. I don't know why. Uh, we were going to talk about uh, uh, the some of the same things I heard back in the 60s. Uh, a guy by name, Timothy Leary. Uh, he uh, kind of a pipe piper leading college kids uh, down the path of, uh, hey, uh, take these drugs. LSD in particular was his big thing. And, uh, and he said that, uh, hey, it sharpens your perception. Some of the things you said just now, sharpens mm -hmm. your perception. You see things better. You see things more clearly, and uh, most of the scientific tests that I have ever read, that they found that no, it does not. As a matter of fact, uh, it does just the opposite. Uh, how, do you how do you compare that time with your time? Or is there well, a no, there's some kind of a comparison to be made. I mean, the 60s, I think, was complicated by two things. First of all, there was a war being fought that was very controversial. And then the other thing that makes LSD... Sorry about Vietnam War. Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing that makes LSD unique is, uh, you know, if you're a first-year biochemistry student and your roommate has a trust fund, you can make six million doses of LSD in your apartment in a long weekend, if you know what you're doing. Six million doses of a hallucinogenic drug is automatically a social problem, a problem for the police, the government. Uh, that's, that's not, that means you're not interested in getting you and your friends high. You're interested in making a fortune in uh, illicit drugs. 
With mushrooms, if a person were to work like a dog for six months, they'd be lucky to produce a couple of thousand hits. So I think the hysteria of the 1960s was based on the fact that LSD physically is a unique drug. So much can be made in an underground situation that it then creates pyramids of criminal activity and a whole bunch of people get all excited. I think it's much uh, better to uh, sort of move uh, with a little stealth and care and consideration. And also, maybe it wasn't the best strategy to target the 18 to 21-year-old segment. Of and, and when you, when you, by, the, by, the, by the way, you lecture at colleges now? Rarely, but occasionally. Or you, do, you, you don't lecture too uh, often at, with kids? Do you talk to kids about I, any of this? I talk to kids if they come to my lectures, which are usually at growth centers like Esalen or someplace like that. But my audience is pretty, a pretty broad demographic and age uh, spread. It isn't a, ch a children's crusade. Yeah. Now, now you, you mentioned uh, the growing of these mushrooms. Uh, how yes. difficult is that, and uh, how do you do it? Well, it's... And, and, and let me just ask this question. I, I think I know the answer, but I, my audience doesn't. Uh, what, what, what are you talking about, a mushroom? Are you talking about the kind that you get at the market? Uh, well, no, you're talking about a near relative of the kind you get at the market. The difference being that uh, these psychoactive mushrooms cr create psilocybin for some reason in their bodies. And psilocybin is a very powerful... Uh, hallucinogenic, much more hallucinogenic than LSD. LSD makes your mind race, you have all kinds of ideas, you have energy, it's all over the map. Psilocybin, done as I advocate doing it, which is in silent darkness uh, with a great deal of care and attention, is almost pure visual activity behind closed eyelids. In other words, you sit in darkness and you see a Niagara of visual imagery. It can be horrifying, it can be exalting, but what's so interesting about it is none of it seems to be your own. It isn't your memory. It seems to be as though we're tapping in here to a portion of the human psyche that most people have very little experience with. Well, I noticed in some of the uh, material that you have written about, you said the mushrooms actually talk to you. Um, what do you mean by that? Yes, this is one of the hardest things to talk about with people who have not had this experience. I was a skeptic for years. Very simply, for reasons unknown to science or anybody else, when you take mushrooms, part of the experience is the presence of a voice in your head which converses with you almost like meeting someone you've never met before but who's very affable and sociable and this doesn't happen with other hallucinogens it seems to be a unique characteristic of psilocybin if psilocybin were legal we could study this and who knows we might learn something about schizophrenia or about how the brain processes language we don't quite know what to make of this phenomenon. Now, now, say you grow some of these mushrooms and you have them, uh, you don't believe in uh, putting them out uh, on a tray when, the party, when you have a big party and the music going and pick, people pick them up and, uh, and bite into them. You don't uh, like the old uh, cookies, the marijuana cookies of, uh, of yesteryear, yesteryear and, uh, and, and some parties where you have cocaine uh, on the table, you don't, you don't go for that. No, you see, the paradox there, and it's always puzzled me, is if you were to take a drug that you didn't like, then your best strategy for getting it out of your body would be vigorous physical exercise in a large crowd of people. Well, isn't that what goes on in a disco bar? So strangely enough, this social style or recreational style of drug taking, take some drug, go to your favorite disco bar and uh, dance your rear end off, is precisely a strategy for avoiding confronting what this substance can actually do. If you will sit down, shut up, and turn off the lights, uh, then you see 
what these things are capable of, but people are afraid, people like the context of social drug taking, and so they miss the point. Okay. Certainly in the Amazon. We're going to get back that to way. that. We're going to get back to that, but um, right now, Michael Clark. Um, uh, Michael, uh, you have not been chewing on mushrooms? Uh, not today. Okay. You can see clearly what's happening in our news? Every word. Michael Clark, KFI News Center. Hey, Thanks, Chief. Thanks. Here the uh, stories are following. Arson investigators say the fire at the Coke compound near Waco was set from inside. The findings support the Fed's claims that the Branch Davidians set the fire. Some of the Branch Davidians arrested afterwards claim the fire started when the ATF began to ram the compound. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Gates on KFI AM 640, more stimulating talk radio. This is the Chief, and we're back, and we're going to let you talk to a very interesting guy, Terrence McKenna. Uh, he has uh, finished a book uh, called True Hallucinations, uh, the untold story of his radical and riveting adventures in search of all kinds of things that uh, he talks about. He's... And he's done other books, uh, but I guess this is the new one out. Uh, this is the new one. It's the, new the one. story of a trip to the Amazon 20 years ago with my brother trying to track down some of these hallucinogenic plants. Uh, yeah, we, were, we were talking about the difference between LSD and uh, mushrooms. We were talking about mushrooms being uh, far more difficult to cultivate, grow, and uh, oh, where LSD and I know uh, what you're talking about uh, is not... <laughs> I've seen a lot of, uh, of chemistry uh, majors in college uh, put the LSD together and, uh, and go to jail for it. Uh, and now we've got uh, mushrooms, don't have as many. You wouldn't put them out. You say in order to really enjoy and get the benefit out of the mushrooms, you have to sit in the dark and, uh, and think uh, about, uh, I assume... Whatever you're going to think about. Whatever's on the agenda. Whatever's you... on the agenda. Do you have a, do you, uh, let me ask you that. Do you, do you have an agenda when you, when you take a hit from a mushroom? Uh, and, and how many mushrooms does it take to, to get uh, I, started? I recommend people take about five dried grams, which is surprising to some people because that's a fairly stiff dose. One of the things well, I... Because you take prodigious amounts. Sir. Well, prodigious amounts, I don't know. Five dried grams is the full spectrum of effects of psilocybin. I think people get into a lot of trouble by taking too little when they decide. Yeah, you do this in the dark, do you lock the doors or... You I unplug the phone. Watch you? I unplug the phone. I make sure there's not going to be any interruption. At times, people have asked me about mushrooms. They say, well, if I take it, will I be able to drive? And I want to tell people that shows you don't understand the concept. No, you will not be able to drive in any sense of the word. Your job is to watch and to learn in the dark. And I'm off a cliff. <laughs> yeah, that's right. that's what it will do for you. And we're going to talk to some of the folks out there that want to talk to you. We're going to talk to Candace in Lancaster. Candace, welcome to KFI. Hi, Chief. You know, this is the first time I've ever tuned in, and I just, this is hysterical. I'm sorry, this is so funny. I can't <laughs> believe this guy is for real. Well, he's sitting here. I mean, he's for real. He's got you a... know, I've got this idea of exactly what he looks like in my mind. He's very, you know, very mellow, very calm. And it's just, it's, it's hysterical. And I just, you know, my point is, is that I really feel in order to see things clearly, I don't need any drug. I don't need any chemical in my body to see things clearly. And... I just feel that when you had stated the comment of the hysteria of the 60s regarding mushrooms or anything else, I just feel that right now we are reaping the consequences of the hysteria of the 60s. Yeah, reaping that whirlwind, you betcha. That's, you know, that's one of the homeless pro problems of the homeless. Oh, uh, yeah. For many of the, uh, the social problems that we have today. Yeah, uh, and look at, you know, the, the children, you know, the kids now that are teenagers who parents, you know, were raised in a hippie time and stuff. It is really frightening. Terrence, you don't, you don't recommend this to kids. No. No, I don't recommend oh. this to kids. Uh, I think we are reaping the whirlwind of the 60s if what you're talking about is drugs. We have a lot of drug problems in society, but I maintain this is a failure of education and a failure of legislation. But how are you going to educate someone on taking something that's not, you know, this mushrooms, I don't care where you get them from, they're not natural. 
You know, when I when I went through a drug period in my teens, we used to take mushrooms. Yeah, you know, but we didn't sit in the dark. Candace, Candace, you didn't take mushrooms. Yeah, no, no you didn't. I, you're too you know, smart. I'm a rebound person. And you know, I want <laughs> well, to tell you something. Instead of studying mushrooms in the Amazons, maybe you need to go to Jerusalem and study the anthrop anthropology and the truth and the fact of the Bible and the artifacts found. Candace, thanks for the call. Really appreciate it. Okay, bye. -bye. So thanks. Keep listening, Candace. Uh, uh, you know, I, Candace has a point. You know, I, I just came back from uh, from the ocean. Uh, I spent the weekend there, and I, I know I don't need anything, man. I can sit there and look at that ocean and see the changes. I can I can feel the sun. I can feel the warmth. I, I can feel life. I don't need any of that junk. Now, why does it? Why do you believe that this is a something that people should do? to enjoy life or to get some answers? Well, I'm not so sure about enjoy life. I think get some answers. I actually did put my time in in Jerusalem. I'm fairly familiar with Kabbalism. I spent time studying it in Jerusalem. My point is, when you're there sitting at the beach enjoying the sunlight and the waves, you're not having sex either. But that's no reason to exclude sex from your life. In other words, my notion is we're on this world for a very brief amount of time. Who knows what it's really for? And you have a whole bunch of buttons, the sexual button, the intellect button, the potential for intoxication on everything from alcohol to psilocybin. My attitude toward life is to explore it top to bottom, side to side. And I've been very fortunate in this. It hasn't uh, proven destructive to me. I'm very upset with the idea that people will go from birth to the grave without ever having a psychedelic experience. That seems to me like having a Mercedes your whole life and never pressing that button in the center dash and finding out what the hell it does. I mean, life is to be lived. All of it, the sitting by the ocean, the psychedelic experiences, whatever. We shouldn't put barriers between ourselves and experience. Well, maybe we should. But anyway, we're going to have to go to uh, <laughs> a guy who uh, looks clearly at the traffic Mark Dennis is going to tell us about. And, Chief, that's because we have this very high-resolution video graphics monitor here, the only one in town. Back to the Chief on KFI AM 640, more stimulating talk radio. And this is the Chief, and we're talking to Terrence McKenna, the author of True Hallucinations, a book out uh, very recently uh, by Harper in San Francisco, and uh, uh, is it doing well? It's doing well, as far as we can tell. It's just been out a couple of weeks, but it seems to be doing very well. Okay. And, and we, had a, we had Jeff on here that was going to ask us, uh, apparently he has used uh, mushrooms and he's wondering whether or not uh, there are any dangers to this. Well, I think if you do it as I suggested it, stay away from automobiles, stay in your apartment and that sort of thing, the main danger is of a panic attack that the dose is for some reason stronger than the person expected or the phenomenon has dimensions to it which are unsettling. Panic attack, I think, is a potential problem. In terms of long-term physical dangers, the record is pretty clear that there's not a problem. There are people in central Mexico who've been taking these things, populations for thousands of years, no detriment there. I think if people will stay in their houses and do these things in a responsible and focused manner, then uh, they're going to be all right. Someone once said to me, the only danger from psilocybin is death by astonishment. <laughs> so if you're worried about that, maybe you better steer clear. Well, now, yeah, you talk about, uh, there is a lot of talk right now about the war on drugs. In fact, we're losing that war. A lot of wimps out there uh, who think we ought to back away from that war. I heard a judge on John and Ken's uh, uh, show the other day, supposedly, I always talk about being a conservative job, judge. He's a wimp in my judgment, talking about uh, legalizing drugs, uh, the worst kind of thing that we can do, uh, because it, it, it sends a message to our kids. And I want to make, make it really clear here, uh, uh, Terrence, because we've been talking uh, and you do not think this is something that the kids ought to pick up and, and do uh, as, a, as a regular kind of thing. 
No, I don't think uh, kids should be doing any drug particularly. But I, I would say about the drug problem, in my opinion, the fact that alcohol and tobacco are legal proves that we can absorb the social consequences of legalizing any drug. We have already legalized the most destructive drug we know, alcohol, and the most addictive drug we know, tobacco. Every society seems to choose out of about 30 or 40 options, two or three drugs, which it proclaims as its drugs, and then to furiously suppress... Okay, the same argument, and I think it's a lousy argument. You're a very bright guy. I think it's a lousy argument. They always throw in the, the, the cigarettes... Uh, I hear that from the doctor who's on just before me, cigarettes and alcohol. And I understand that's a, that's a tremendously destructive pair of, of drugs, both alcohol and cigarettes. It's done tremendous damage to our population. Uh, but it just seems to me that it's idiotic to say, well, since we've, we've legalized these two drugs, we ought to open it up to all the other drugs. Uh, you know, that, that is just a, a very, very poor argument, my judgment. But if that seems idiotic to you, then your position should be that we should make alcohol and tobacco illegal. That would be the, the, the times in this the times in this nation when when alcohol was illegal. Uh, we have been a better nation. We have had less crime, less social problems. Uh, it has been a better time for us in this nation. People can't remember that because they think back to. Prohibition. They talk about the gangsters and all of that. But it was the lowest level of street crime, lowest level of violent crime in this nation's history. Uh, and, and so, yeah, what, it's not a bad idea, except there's a big difference here. Uh, you talk about your mushrooms. You go into a dark room and you get on this big trip. You all these hallucinations. Uh, I, look, I can have a beer and I don't have a single hallucination. Matter of fact, what I want to do is go to sleep. But no hallucinations whatsoever. I can have a martini. No hallucin hallucinations, and most people are like that. It's a matter of moderation, but when you take drugs, particularly the hallucinogenics, there is no moderation. None. Zero. Well, I would disagree. I think that you can, in the confines of your home, explore these states and be on time for work the next morning, and society has yeah, not but, suffered. Yeah, but at that time, you are not in control. You have no control whatsoever of yourself. While, while you're under under these drugs, you already said, you better make sure uh, you, you're, you're in great care uh, when you consume the mushrooms uh, and in a dark room. And, uh, and and it's the same thing with LSD. Uh, it's the same thing with, 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 with marijuana. Uh, you, you, you take marijuana well, to get drunk. That's what you take marijuana for. The problem is, Chief, that we don't have a consistent policy here. We tell our children drugs are bad, and then they see drugs being consumed throughout society. We legalize some drugs. We make others illegal. I'm of the opinion that if cannabis were legal, wouldn't we be in a better position if every alcoholic... We're a pothead. We're gonna we're gonna go to a traffic break. Uh, what do you think, Mark? Uh, should every alcoholic be a pothead? And not during my <laughs> shift. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mark. <laughs> All right, Chief. The mystery report from the KFI Traffic Center. Is and now back to the man who can legally speed on the freeway. It's the Chief, Chief Gates on KFI AM 640, more stimulating talk radio. No speed here. Mushrooms. We're gonna go right to the telephones. We're gonna talk to Mike in Studio City. Welcome to KFI, Mike. Oh, thank you, Chief. How are you? Sure. Good. 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 Okay. Question for Terrence? Yeah, Terrence, did you, uh, you know, in all your academic work, because I'm an academician myself, take into account the, the fact that, for example, during the opium wars in China, one of the big issues was you were adding an additional drug to a society that was already overloaded, and the Indian opium was very, very strong, stronger than the Chinese opium, and it really knocked them for a loop why the imperial dynasty went against the importation of that stuff. It caused the kind of, uh, shall we say, fallback to anarchy that perhaps you're glorifying as the fallback to the original uh, Garden of Eden. But when you take in the scale and size and the numbers of society, uh, you know, we need organization and, and uh, civilization requires a certain amount of coercion. And it seems as if the 1960s mentality that you're running here it just is countercourse and counterproductive for a new generation of kids who are willing to experiment 
Well, you know, the uh, opium wars in China, people forget that what the issue there was, was the British wanted to sell opium in the free ports of China, and the imperial government told them to get lost, and so they sent gunboats and forced the Chinese to accept the sale of opium. Now, the reason the English were interested in doing that is that the tea trade had collapsed, and they had all these ships standing idle, and they had the idea that they could grow opium in Goa in India and recoup their losses. So in less than a hundred years, what drug wars has meant uh, has changed from a government forcing another government to let it deal opium to a war on citizens who freely choose to exercise their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If the pursuit of happiness doesn't cover a citizen's right to self-experiment with psychoactive compounds, then it's a little hard to understand what it means. The answer to this drug thing is three words. Education, education, education. Well, I... I... <laughs> I heartily agree with the need to educate our people, uh, and that's one of the reasons that we uh, push the D.A.R.E. program in our schools, drug abuse resistance education with our kids, because the kids need to know uh, how to say no to drugs, and, uh, uh, and there's so much more I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, naturally, we have a, a built-in disagreement here in terms of what we ought to do in terms of legalizing uh, drugs in this nation. Uh, my view is that... Uh, we can win this war, and, and I will tell you this, I think we'll win the war uh, principally through uh, education, but I think also we have to send out a very, very strong message that uh, in our society uh, that if we all choose to do what is best for us in the pursuit of our own individual happiness, uh, we're going to have a real serious, serious problem. We'll never be able to dig ourselves, and we'll probably hope that, as you point out, that in 20 years the earth will implode. It probably will. Hey, thanks very much for being here. It is the top of the hour. This is KFI 640 AM, where you get more stimulating, not from mushrooms, more from talk, more stimulating talk radio.